You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Are you still yourself if you can't remember who you used to be? Welcome everyone to the next episode of Systematic Ecology. We are the priests to the geeks. I am, of course, am your host, Christian Ashley. I am joined today by the greatest co-host of any timeline, past, present, future, alternate world. My man, TJ Blackwell. How are you doing, TJ? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad that that bit is spreading. I love it so much. Well, it's always good to put the most important person in the room in the spotlight, as they often always deserve, I should say. Often. That's awful. Always deserve. So, TJ, what do you mean geeking out on? Man, I had an answer lined up, ready to go for so long, and I forgot until I started this sentence, and then I felt like I needed to finish. But it's Cookie Clicker, the once very popular app wherein you click cookies. Okay. Love it. Loving it. Great time. It's uh, it's like Adventure Capitalist, <laughs> the, the game, if you've played that before, except you're not trying to make money, just cookies. Excellent. I've solved I, world hunger. <laughs> I too had an answer until I asked a question myself. So we're mutually in that realm there. So I'm going to say, I probably said it before, but I'll say it again. I watched the last episode of Vinland Saga yesterday, and that was one of the best episodes I have ever seen in anime, period, throwing, uh, showing Thorfinn's journey to like come at, at the start at peace with himself and then say, I'm going to head on this new path and reject the person I used to be. Love it. Incredible show. Guys, yeah. if you're not watching Vinland Saga, ignore this in anime. Just go watch it. Yeah. Formative, formative piece of media. Truly incredible. Most definitely. So our topic of discussion today, for those of you who didn't read the episode description, is Knights of the Old Republic, specifically the first game. Now, TJ, would you like to let the good people know what the Knights of the Old Republic is? Oh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is, to this day, no worse than the third best Star Wars game of all time. When you take control of, uh, you know what, spoiler warning, the game is 20 years old. Have at it. You play as Revan. You don't know you're Revan. It's awesome. It's great. Knights of the Old Republic is one of those games when I first played it, I hated it. I didn't like the turn-based system. I had to get used to it. But as I kept going, it's like, oh my gosh, this is one of the best Star Wars stories ever told. Uh, In my opinion, this is behind two when we get to that. That is my favorite game, spoilers of all time. But the original is well worth the check, even all these years later. Like, I replayed it a year or two ago and still found things that I hadn't done after all this time. So much fun. But it's essentially, we are about a little 3,960-some years before the events of A New Hope, where we've had a Mandalorian war where the Jedi rose up to fight against them, but we also had a schism between the Jedi as Sith secrets were leaked to the Jedi. Some of them fell to the dark side. Now we're at a Jedi civil war and we find ourselves above the the planet of Terrace where we're trying to fight against Dark Revan in a cut scene. Bastila, the main Jedi at this moment, is trying to make sure he can't take over the entire galaxy. And then suddenly we find ourselves... Oh, excuse me. No, later on, I'm mixing scenes that happened before all this. We're actually fighting Malak in the original opening. And then we ourselves, the player character, end up on the city of uh, the planet of Terrace, where we eventually find out who we are along the way. You can be a Jedi. You can be a smuggler. You can be someone who just uses blasters all day long or just used force and not even a lightsaber. Night the Old Republic adds a lot of variety and it's phenomenal. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, one of the best role playing games of all time, in my opinion. Uh, I actually I love the turn based system. It was it was like my first introduction to like random number generator, as in a d twenty, because that's actually what's happening when you attack something in this game. It it rolls yep. a digital d twenty and adds your bonuses. Uh, it's great. I've always, and when I found that out, I like had an epiphany. And realized that maybe math's not that bad. I was wrong, <laughs> but it was good to have that experience. Yeah, I had that same experience too. Outside of the math is good because I've never believed that once in my life. But learning how the system actually worked over time, so oh, so that's why I missed that attack. Oh, this is why I succeeded in this you know skill check. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. That it just seems random to me. 
No, it's a dice roll. And yet it's randomness in itself, you could say, but at least I know the mechanism behind it rather than this vague whatever. So TJ, how did you find yourself diving into the world of KOTOR? So way back in the day when movie gallery still existed, uh, we, we frequented the movie gallery. Uh, we'd like to rent movies and eventually they started offering games to rent. Uh, I think they did that the whole time. We just never did it. But, uh, one of those, I remember we went the final time that we went to movie gallery. Uh, it's not because it was about to collapse or anything. It was several years before that. Uh, but uh, we rented Sonic Riders and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 because Star Wars game. Why not? Yeah. And we never took it back. <laughs> and then the company collapsed. So I don't owe them money. The blockbuster conundrum it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much how it started. Uh, I was obsessed with the game. Didn't really understand it. I was a whopping seven years old, maybe eight. Uh, but I played it all the time. I loved it. And eventually, after I'd beaten it several times, uh, it was too scratched to keep working. But I, I was able to get KOTOR 1 and play that and thought it was not as fun because KOTOR 2 is m my favorite game of all time. Oh. But... <laughs> Still excellent. Yeah, I think it released in 2003, 2004, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. My dad bought it for me, I think also with Jedi Outcast, you know, because my dad and I are just huge Star Wars nerds. And getting into that uh, was a bunch of, but both of those games are really fun. But KOTOR, number one, it took me a while to get in the game, like I said, because I wasn't used to the system and I was a dumb teenager who didn't understand the different things are good. Change can be a good thing sometimes. But as I kept going with it, because I wanted to experience the story, I fell in love with the characters, with the worlds, with the lightsaber combat, with the way things were going in the game. It was such a beautiful experience. Like even being a dumb teenager at that time, seeing it, reading the back of the box, I had named my character Darth Revan because I thought I was edgy and cool. Thinking, oh, yeah, just say, oh, hey, Darth Revan, have you heard of Darth Revan? And just giggling like a little idiot. And then when the reveal happened later on, because we're already spoiling that, who cares? I didn't get it at first until, oh, oh, what a tremendous moment in gaming history. Yeah. One of the greatest plot twists of all time, I think. Because it's foreshadowed just subtly enough to where you feel if you, you're looking for it, you're going to find it. And if you don't, you don't feel like it comes out of left field. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so well executed. Oh, yeah. It's just fantastic. So this game itself is actually based on some comics that were written in the 90s. They are called The Tales of the Jedi. Those of you more recently will have watched The Tales of the Jedi that Disney Plus released. Kind of a similar vein, but to an extent of focusing on different Jedi. These were Jedi 4,000 years before the events of A New Hope, as they're traversing across the galaxy, trying to solve problems, and they find the Sith for the first time. Now, TJ, how familiar are you with these comics? And if so, do you think they're required reading to understand what's happening? Not familiar at all. So Fair no. enough. <laughs> I did not know they existed until later on as well. But what they do, as in with most uh, stuff that's extra, they help enhance the world, help you understand like, okay, this is how things got to the way they are right now. So I definitely recommend you guys to go ahead and check that out. I probably should have saved that for our recommendation bit, but you know, whatever. That brings us to that. So moving into the game itself, part of the journey of KOTOR like with many other Star Wars games to focus on Jedi and Sith, is this idea of like struggling with the light and dark side of the Force. Which of these did you gravitate towards in your playthroughs and why, TJ? Uh, I've always been a good guy. I hate to make people upset. Also, I like blue more than red. <laughs> I feel that 100%. I, I was not allowed to be on the dark side as a child, uh, as a teenager. It was one of those rules, like I never got to play like Grand Theft Auto or anything like that growing up. It was probably for the best at that age. But uh, if there was an option to be good or bad, it always had to be good. So that's one of the things my parents were trying to teach me. It's like, look, you can go this path and terrible things are going to happen. Or it's a lot harder to be good and have all these things occur. And like, and the games do that too. It's like, it's more difficult sometimes to be good because you get people throwing accusations at your face or saying you did something that you didn't, or you'd lose out on a reward if you were just more conniving and evil. That would be better for your character to have like this lightsaber crystal or what have you. So yeah, I always did light side. Now, did you play male or female Revan? I played male Revan just because I, I wanted to. 
I wanted to be the Star War. <laughs> you wanted to be the Star War himself? Yeah, that was, that was me. I was the same way. Like, I was a little 13, 14 year old. I was like, I can't be a girl. Why would you even give him the option? I was like, so dumb. Like, I still haven't played as a female Revan, and we'll get to why I played as a female Exile in the next game, because that's completely separate. But yeah, male Revan, light side. So one of the things the game does offer as well is this fun cast of characters and very dynamic companions for you to travel along with. Is there one in particular like you felt more drawn to towards than others? Uh, Jolie Bindo. Jolie Bindo is one of my favorite Jedi of all time. It's just he's he comes in so late to the game. Uh, but once he's there for me, and like at that point, you can already have other Jedi in your party. Like you can turn your other companions into Jedi by that point. Uh, doesn't matter. Jolie Bindo is not leaving the party after he gets to into the game. Absolutely. So this this man is so much fun. He is the cool old man personified. He just brings an energy to the game. It desperately lacks. He's a snarker, but he's so also wise at the same time. So he's a trickster mentor. He's a Jedi. He's able to do things in your uh, party that other people can't. He never left my party. That's why I think after I w- left Dantooine, my first place I always went to was Kashyyyk. So I could grab mm-hmm. Joe Lee and just have fun with this man for the rest of the game. Yeah. And he's, he brings a lot of Mace Windu energy that not enough Star Wars media has. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. He's just he's just fun to have around, like to have his insights on the way. Like I still remember his speech about how he knew this guy back in the day who was basically like a chosen one kind of prophecy, but it all ended up with him exploding after being thrown down like this shaft or something and destroying a warlord and like causing peace to reign in this part of this galaxy. But all because he was so hot headed and full of himself that it got to his head and he died as a result. It's like that's such a fun just a little that has no bearing on the story whatsoever, but it builds the world up so well. And Joe Lee, you believe him when he says that. Yeah. He's also really like the first exposure, I would call it mainstream exposure, that we get to a gray Jedi. Yeah, and we'll be discussing that later on as well. But yeah. uh, anyone besides Joe Lee, I mean, we gave the same answer. It's not fair to everyone else. Who's your number Heart two? Is okay. Okay. Heart school. HK 47. Oh, that's the obvious choice right there. My little murder machine calling me a meatbag the entire playthrough. I love him. Yep. Query master. <laughs> I got a little annoying with how they did with the HK fifties later on. Every sentence had to open with it and they talked a lot, but yeah. HK 47 himself. Perfect to the story. I also really love Candorous. I never really had either one of these in my party because I was all Jedi all the time. So uh, when I couldn't use Bastila, it was Juhani, even though Juhani is fine as a character. Just not my favorite mm. in the game. But HK, as a character himself, love him so much. Yeah. It, it took me a long time to realize that Juhani was recruitable. <laughs> Did like you a lot her? of years. It took a lot of years to, to find that out because uh, she made me angry. Yeah. So Juhani being one character very early on in the game when you're on Dantooine, who is a Jedi apprentice who uh, struck her master in anger and thinks that she killed him, if I'm remembering correctly, mm-hmm. and has decided she's going to be on the dark side now because she has these evil thoughts. And you can have the option of just killing her and saying, well, she was an apostate. It was better for everyone if she just dies. Or you have the option of trying to redeem her, which you can do, and then have her as a member of your party. So yep. I definitely understand how little little TJ made that choice to murder Juhani, but it Perfect. is what it is. Yeah. Bastila was also usually in the party. Yeah. Uh, not a whole lot of reasons not to have her there. Oh, yeah. She's great as well as basically your deuterogenist for the game of taking focus, not away from you, but as a secondary focus. She learns a lot in this game. And then if you see how she eventually she essentially made you. As we get to that later on, it's a very huge character moment for her as whether or not she falls as well and whether you can bring her back to the light or choose to remain there with her in, in the dark side. Yeah. So moving on from that, one of the other cool things about this game is your ability to explore the Star Wars galaxy. And exploring other planets has just been one of those things you really want to do. You just want to stay on Coruscant the whole game. You don't want to stay on Naboo the whole game. You get to visit eight planets with uh, the Yavin 4 DLC which I think is included in all KOTOR 1 packs right now. Do you have a fl- uh, favorite planet you go to, TJ? Yeah, my uh, my favorite planet is uh, <laughs> probably Manon. Okay. 
I love Manon. Uh, wow, I like sick. sea creatures a lot. I'm rocking with swimming animals. Uh, and Manon is gorgeous. I mean, really stunning. This is our first point of contention this entire time. Because I was going to ask who your least favorite was. I'll say, it's, there's not a lot to do there. It's the only <laughs> downside. Manon's story is not long enough. Uh, I wish you could spend more time there. I wish more happened to there. But it's still my favorite. Big fan of the ocean. I like the lore that it brings, but I'll get to my least favorites later. We're talking about favorites right now. And other than just, I mean, it's fun to explore Dantooine. My favorite is actually Korriban because of all the things you can do there. Like you can even redeem a Sith Lord from over a thousand years ago if you play your cards right. That is astonishing. Well, I mean, he may be a dark Jedi. I can't remember exactly. But the fact that you can do that, you can explore all these tombs. It's the archaeology, the Indiana Jones part of Star Wars. That's a lot of fun. And to manipulate both Uthar Wynn and, um, oh gosh, who's, what is her name? The the Twi'lek Uthuraban. Mission. No, no. Mission is our, I think it's Uthuraban and, no, wait, no, whatever. There's a Twi'lek and another guy, and they're the heads of the Sith Academy there. Oh. And you can no, play them that. together against each other and even redeem her in the end because she used to be a former jedi and it's so fun like you can pit the sith against each other while still being on the light side and i love that you can do something so complex as that because normally be like oh well they're evil and sith therefore i have to kill them so i love korriban that's my favorite what's your uh, least favorite tj yeah i would say to be fair korriban is a very close second favorite because there's just so much to do but uh, I'm really not sure if I have a least favorite at this point. I would say it's going to be Terrace because mm. I have to do it every time. And it's so long and it gets so boring. I could play Terrace with my eyes closed. Probably. Uh, I, I replay it once a year and for the first hour, every time, sometimes two hours. Cause I get a little forgetful. I'm like, man, when does this planet end? <laughs> I feel you 100% there. It's not my least favorite, but it kind of feels like Paragus does in KOTOR 2. To be like, can I please just please. skip ahead? I have done this over and over again with a low level and not as good weapons. And just let me get to Telos or what have you. Let me get to Dantooine if we're talking KOTOR 1 specifically. But actually, my least favorite, as I hinted before, is Manon. And like I said, I love, like because this planet was created for the game and the South Cath, I believe, were as well. And it brings a rich lore. As someone who really loves reading into the lore a little more than he should, I love Legends canon. I love what they bring in with Manon, with the Kulto, and having them being neutral in this war between Sith and Jedi. But that's also one of his big hindrances to me, because like having to navigate the government there and staying on your best behavior the whole time, I hated it. And the murder trial as well, you have to do. Not as fun to me. As well as having... To when you're on the sea floor, as cool as it looks, as slow as you walk, haste. I, even with that, I I'm, I just want to be done with it. By the very I end. always, 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 always have master level haste before I go to Manon. <laughs> and that would be a good reason to have it right there, because those segments can take forever. Mm -hmm. And especially but, when you're having to fight all with those culto sharks or whatever they are. Yeah. With your little sonic emitter. Yeah. No, I I love Manon. I love the bureaucracy part. It's also fun to me. I just wish there was more to do there. Fair enough. I do, I do enjoy when you go back for, what is it, the Gino Hadron uh, quest line with that, the guild of a, what, like assassins or cabal a Illuminati group yeah. that you're actually secretly, spoilers for Oblivion as well, like killing the head members of the group for one guy. That was a cool reveal as well. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, it's great. I love Manon. So we've, we've already said it blatantly before, but we might as well just keep going. A major reveal in this game is that the player character is none other than Darth Revan, who's essentially been brainwashed by the Jedi to be a weapon against the Sith army he helped create. Now, TJ, I ask you, is it ethical to delete the memories of evil people so that they can reintegrate themselves into society? I might would say yes, but okay. I don't think Revan is one of these people. Hmm. Revan was never evil. How's that? Uh, the reason Revan defected to the dark side is because the Jedi weren't willing to fight the Mandalorian War. He knew how to do it. He knew how they could win and save the galaxy from Mandalorian rule. So he took off, learned some Sith secrets, 
and came back, took a bunch of Jedi, and caused the war himself, or fought the war, basically himself. And one of the things we do learn in later canon as well is that he found something out there in the unknown regions that being part of the galaxy that isn't explored by the Republic, which would we find later on would be the actual true Sith. And he was concerned that the Republic wasn't ready for it. So he was going to try and take it over himself to have a united front. But along the way, you see he kind of loses his path and that he allows these atrocities to happen. Like, sure, Telos, excuse me, not, yeah, Telos gets basically glassed under his command. And then we see it happen to Terrace too in KOTOR 1, Telos being KOTOR 2. And then we get all these atrocities of Sith committing. Of course, a lot of people are falling to the dark side, abusing the people on their command. So I would say Revan at this point in time is objectively evil, even though he started with the best of intentions. Fallen. <laughs> Lost his way. There you go. The only planet he blew up twice was Malachor 5. And the second one wasn't even really him. So, yeah. And to be fair, it kind of needed to be blown up after that point. Yeah. But so, you, I mean, you think it's okay to do this? Let's say uh, we have, you know, triple homicide. You can either have the rest of your life in jail or we can uh, change your mind to be this other person. Uh, I think if we're letting people choose, then it's definitely ethical. Okay. So allowing a choice in the matter is ethical, but if we say it's governmentally mandated, you have to do this, no more prisons, we just mind wipe people, make them someone new, that's okay? Well, I think that's a little bit more messed up uh, because you're taking away people's agency. I'm a huge fan of freedom of choice, uh, you know. Just put me in jail. <laughs> I couldn't help but think of this. I don't, have you watched Babylon 5, TJ? Uh, as little as possible. That's fair. It's not for everyone. But there is, I want to say in like the third or fourth season, you find this group of priests and monks who end up on the station. And one of them used to be a serial killer. And he was mind wiped and forced by the government to join this uh, group of monks and now believes, at least as far as Chuck is concerned, in, in Jesus and his message, and is a pacifist this time around. Like, so, okay, so we've already brought that up. Suppose someone has given their life to Christ before being brainwashed, but after being brainwashed, they have no memory of that in their new program life. Are they still saved, despite not actively following God, or are they an entirely new self who needs redemption again? They're entirely new? They so weren't you saved, that? you know, in this new memory file? So what happens to the old the old man in this case? He just doesn't exist. So you think there's two, there's a split, uh, the soul split, or there are two separate souls that once inhabited this body, and now there's one that's gone? Well, I think the soul is no longer itself. The soul and the mind are inherently linked. Okay. If you wipe one, you know. This one, I could go either way on this, honestly. Because like thinking of that, uh, the Babylon 5 episode... It was really rather poignant because the writer is a huge – I can't remember if he's come out as an atheist or agnostic. I want to say I want to say agnostic. And to see him bring in something that Christian writers have failed to do spectacularly time and time again was a lot of fun. But as far as it concerns with like Revan, since we're talking about KOTOR, I think that the Revan who fell is an entirely separate entity from the Revan that we create ourselves. And that's why he's such a blank slate at the beginning. We can make him whoever we want whether he follows the dark or the light. And I could see the argument for, say, someone was saved and then they were brainwashed by whatever technology this was. And now they're a completely whole new person. I would see how someone could argue like, look, it's over. You need to be born again, again. Yeah. Yeah. I would say they have to get saved again. What do you guys think? Let us know on our episode discussion thread on Discord to see who's right and who's wrong or bring in some more Bible to make us both look like fools. We're all for that. Please. Constructive criticism. Yeah. Or more Star Wars Legends books. Oh, we could always discuss more of that. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about the Darth Bane books. <laughs> I, hey, you want to sign up for those episodes? Let's do them later on, those TJ. Those are my favorite ones. Those are astonishing. Also written by one of the head writers of KOTOR. Yep. One of my favorite Drew. writers, period. Caprician. Carpishan. Carpishan. Yeah. One of those things. Yeah. Yeah, I said it wrong. Whatever I said, don't say that. He also worked on Mass Effect, too. So, we brought up Legends, but go ahead. In Legends canon, and inside the game itself, the idea of Grey Jedi is explored. Those who use the Force in a way that utilizes both the light side and the dark side. Is such a thing even possible, 
or will someone who utilizes the darkness always end up succumbing to it? Uh, you know, uh, a wise man once said, uh, practice moderation in all things or something like that. Um, so I think it's definitely possible. We see Mace Windu notably uses some dark side influence, uh, which is especially apparent if you read the Mace Windu book, Shatterpoint. Matthew Stover, one of my favorite Star Wars authors. Yeah. Uh, but we see Mace Windu does it fine up until his supposed death. We'll see. <laughs> we got a Windu truther over here. Always. And uh, Ahsoka currently is a gray Jedi. That's excellent to bring her up as well as like being explored in the actual canon. Uh, Ahsoka is not a Jedi right now, uh, even yeah. in the current age. And ever since she left the the Jedi Temple, she has been this other thing. She's not been a Sith. She's not a dark Jedi. She's not a Jedi. I'd argue she is a gray Jedi as well. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's just gray Jedi exist. Jolie Bendo, my personal favorite one. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to call Mace a gray Jedi, but no. Ahsoka definitely is. So if if you're not into the expanded content, there you go. Ahsoka's your gray Jedi. I think Qui-Gon was on the verge of becoming a gray Jedi right before his death. Because I think the way he was seeing the future going when he saw Anakin, like he'd already had these thoughts. And I think Dooku, if Dooku had not had the influence of Emperor Palpatine, could have gone this way as well. But as far as being able to utilize the darkness without succumbing to it, I definitely see it as as far as Star Wars is concerned. I say absolutely yes. Now, you bring that into the real world. I'm going to have a little more objections. But as far as light and dark side go, is it really evil if I use force lightning to power up a generator? Well, your idea of what force lightning is, is to use, be used for torture and killing people. But if I use it in this way, is it so wrong? If I, right. you know, I mean, force push is not an inherently evil Jedi ability. If I use it to push someone who's about to shoot a civilian off the edge of a cliff, is that evil? I'd argue no. I mean, I brought up Matthew Stover earlier and my favorite book in all of Star Wars. And in fact, one of my favorite books of all time is Traitor from the New Jedi Order series. And that's one of the questions posed to the main character, Jason Solo, the uh, twin child of Han and Leia. The original. Is, yeah, yeah the, the real child of Han and Leia. Sorry. The actual. This, this is not a sequel trilogy hating moment as much as I often tend to go that way. But Jason in this book is struggling to figure out how to use the Force correctly under the tutelage of Verger, who was actually a member of the old Jedi Order, before she disappeared and was taken by the Yuuzhan Vong. I know I'm throwing a, a lot of proper nouns out your way. We were talking about KOTOR 1, so I'll try not to get too in-depth there. But I love how they play with the idea of you can do these things. Is it so evil if a predator is a couple kilos overweight because it eats more than it's supposed to? Like, is that evil or is it just eating? Is it just an animal? So I think the same premise can be brought here when it comes to the Jedi is – being able to utilize the dark without following, falling into it. I mean, because definitely, I mean, gameplay story and segregation being a thing, you can use force lightning. You can use force uh, destruction and stuff like that as a Jedi, and no one calls you out on it. Yeah, it's just going to cost you more. Yeah. For mechanics. So there is an extra cost. You're right. All I have to say, I'm on a side of yes. Now, we're talking about the real world. I'd say we should be a little more cautious. Uh, whether this ability exists, especially in light of salvation and uh, helping out other people, like watch what you're doing. Like then you get the arguments of what's well, okay. I just lied so I can make this person look good. Or I just stole that because I just really needed it. And we've already talked too much on this discussion, but let's move on. So TJ, before we start wrapping things up, is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we do this? Um, Not Exactly, but read the Darth Bane books. They're great. Uh, and if you haven't played Knights of the Old Republic, it might be one of the easiest Star Wars games to buy and to get into because you can buy it on your phone. Yep. You can play the entire game on your phone. So do it, please. All right. Well, with that said, how would you rate and review Knights of the Old Republic 1? Uh, 9.9. I should have known. I should have known before you open your mouth, those would be the exact numbers that would leave. Mm-hmm. Okay. Explain your philosophy again to the good people, TJ. Well, I think nothing is perfect. <laughs> that's so maddening. Uh, I'm going to give it a 9.5 because 
it's not as polished as what would later come out in KOTOR 2. Uh, it's not as, the story is fine, but it's not as good as what would have come eventually. So if I have to compare the two, when I'm going to give KOTOR 2 a 10 out of 10, because you're allowed to do that and get away with it, then I'm going to rate this just a little lower. Yeah, that's fair. All right. We've already mentioned some recommendations. Do you want to throw any other ones out there before we end this episode? Not really. Um, Play Nights Real Republic 1 and 2. <laughs> a solid recommendation. These are stellar games, guys. If you get Amazing the chance, games. grab them. They're so much cheaper now. There's a remake coming out, supposedly. that They just had some issues with the the dev leaders, but maybe we just have to wait longer to get to it, which I'm fine with as long as we get a good game. I'd like to see it again with updated graphics. So when that eventually happens, you know, four or five years from now, I'm all right. As far as recommendations go, if you want to get into your Star Wars journey and the Legends continuity where this would take place in, go to the Thrawn trilogy, especially for people right now watching your Mandalorian and Ahsoka's. You may remember Thrawn got name dropped. Watch Rebels, get there to see who he is. But for the Legends continuity, check out the Thrawn trilogy, one of the best trilogies ever written. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Thank you all for joining us today. This was a fun episode. Like, I'm so glad that we got to talk about it. These games, I'm so passionate about them. I can't wait till we get to our KOTOR 2 episode to talk more about that. TJ will be leading when we eventually get to the MMO. That'll be his way. I'll be there as uh, vocal support because I've never played. I've seen people play, but not played them myself. Yeah. So go ahead. I might get check it. out our web. Yeah, I might ahead. honestly just get a guest. I might just bring on a guest. My roommate That's plays fine. it way more than I do. If that's how it goes, that's how it goes. Guys, check out our website, systematicgeekology.org. You can see our stuff on the shop there. Got some clothes, some mugs, everything that your geeky needs that you're going to need over there. If you like the both of us, or you only like one of us, or you love none of us, and you don't ever want to see an episode that we're on, we have a tab on our website. We can say, oh, they're on this episode? I'm going to avoid that. Or they're on this episode and actually like what they have to say. Check it out over there on the website. As well, I mentioned before, our Discord Head out that way. Let us know how you feel about this episode in particular or any other ones that you've listened to. We have discussions on anime there. We have discussions on comics there, on the newest Marvel movies, everything. Go out, head to our Discord, join up. As well, join up with our Patreon. This is what keeps the lights on and helps keep us allowing to be able to produce more and more that hosts the website for us. It comes from the money. It comes from Patreon. Thank you all for your support if you are a Patreon member. And as always, we also have episode topic ideas on our website you can say hey like you guys haven't discussed this are you crazy this is one of the greatest things i've ever loved bring it up let us know and we will probably do it so guys remember we are all the chosen people a geekdom of priests This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.